Hey, how you doing? It's Clayton here from HowToDrawComics.net and welcome to today's video. It's going to be a long one, so uh, we're continuing on with the Cyber Spectre uh, comic book commission that I did for Richard M's a little while ago now. And uh, we're, we're right into the inking stage here. So we've got the major outlines done for the illustration. And now what we're going to focus on in this video is the rendering phase. So this is probably the part of inking that takes the longest. It's kind of the easiest and the most fun part about inking, but it's also very time consuming. And uh, that's for a number of reasons, but mostly it's the amount of inking and, and fine details that you're going to be doing in order to, you know, shade different aspects of the illustration. In this particular moment, what I'm shading is Cyber Spectre's hair. Now, she's a blonde, so the amount of rendering that I'm going to add into her hair is going to be significantly less than the amount of rendering that I'm going to add into the other character's hair who happens to be a brunette, okay? And because she's got a darker tone of hair, that brunette is going to require more rendering to bring down the level of tone that I'm trying to convey there. Whereas here with Cyber Spectre, because she's a blonde, she's going to have some shading just to describe the form of the overall hairstyle and, you know, the layering and the volume and the amount of a lift to not only describe the shape of the hairstyle, but the actual forms that it consists of to give it depth, to give it that uh, sense of 3D-ness. And, uh, but also on top of that, we are trying to convey the, the tone of the overall hair, okay? So it's a value. Like, we can't describe it necessarily with color here because we're working with black and white line art, but we can indicate its level of tone, its, its level of value. And, uh, you know, later on, of course, that'll kind of indicate to the colorist exactly, you know, how that hair should be shaded. or It'll more indicate to the audience, really, uh, as to what tone the hair is going to be. But uh, regardless of that, that's something that I'm keeping in mind here. So I don't want to over-render Cyber Spectre's hair too much, because if I do that, it's going to bring the tone down too low, and it won't suggest what I'm trying to suggest here, which is that she is a blonde. So these are the kind of things that you have to try to keep in mind, as well as the fact that, you know, in order to place this rendering accurately in a way that does describe the overall hairstyle with depth, with, with the right shape and volume, we've got to consider the lighting conditions within the scene. Okay, so where is the light source coming from? Well, in this particular case, the light source is hitting the character from the top right, by the looks of it, <laughs> just uh, just judging on, on the rendering that I placed in thus far. Now, before I place in that rendering, there's very little indication other than the line weights as to where exactly that light source is positioned. But I use the positioning of the light source to tell me where the rendering needs to be placed. And that's all I really need to, to figure that out, to, to kind of strategize my approach to rendering. Because without that consideration, the rendering process becomes somewhat randomized. You don't really know what rendering needs to go where or what kind of purpose it's serving. And rendering, really every line that you place into your artwork should serve some purpose. Now you'll notice that I didn't really articulate the rendering in the penciling stage. I've left it essentially to the final inks in order to do that. And that's because for me, at this point in um, my artistic journey, I've kind of cut out the middleman of penciling and decided that, hey, I don't need to refine the finer details in the penciling stage. I can just do that in the inking. And um, I've said that before, it does kind of require a little bit of confidence to be able to pull that off and to to feel uh, assured enough that that's the, the right thing to do. But after some practice and, you know, kind of taking the dive into that particular approach, I felt like it was definitely the best decision that I could make because let me tell you, rendering, again, it takes a while. It takes some time to complete and uh, especially hair. Hair is one of the most complex time-consuming aspects of a character that you'll ever work on. And so, you know, having to do that in a penciling stage only to have to go over in the inking stage is kind of just a waste of time. You may as well just leave it to the inking stage to do that stuff, especially if you're working digitally, because if you make a mistake and you mess up, you can just erase it. 
Now these render lines that I'm placing in for the hair, you'll notice that they're specifically running along and following the overall flow and shape of the already established hairstyle. And it's very important that these render lines help to support that shape and form by essentially running along it, you know, making sure that those every single hatch curves along that form. Because if we can do that, then the hair's going to look much more solid. We're going to have a much better idea as to how it's flowing. It's going to have a bit more shape to it, and that shape will be more obvious visually. Because if it becomes too ambiguous and people can't really tell how the hair is forming, the style overall is going to fall apart. It's not going to make any sense. People who are looking at the artwork, the audience, aren't going to be able to break down and understand what it is they're looking at. I mean, your job as a, as a comic book illustrator is to make that experience as pleasurable and easy as possible, which means you don't want to make them work to try and figure out what it is you're trying to illustrate to them, what it is you're trying to show them. Uh, if they have to work that out and they're, they're sitting there scratching their head trying to figure out, hey, w what are you trying to show me here? Well, then uh, they're, they're going to feel a disconnect. You know, they're not going to be engaged. Instead, they're going to be, you know, again, they're just going to be sitting there wondering and, and trying to figure out what it is you're showing them rather than just experiencing it, which is really what you want them to do, especially with a comic book illustration of any kind, whether it be a cover or sequentials, you know, this is a cover, of course, that I'm working on, but, you know, covers are difficult because you kind of have to describe an entire story, an entire narrative in one single frame. You have to give away a lot of information and, uh, and communicate that effectively within a single shot. So, uh, you know, you, you really want to make sure that any processing power your audience has to go through, it's, it's to process the story and the idea that you're trying to show them, not the the illustration, the, the vehicle that is supposed to be, you know, bringing that idea to them. So uh, does that kind of make sense? I hope it does, because I think that, you know, the part that we need to take care of as artists is making the artwork suggestive enough, making it clear enough that the idea is able to hit the audience, is able to be absorbed by the audience with the least amount of friction as possible. And uh, I think that, yeah, if, if you can do that, then you're, you've essentially managed to overcome the hardest part of illustration. Okay, so we've got the hair done. Now it's time to move on to the chrome rendering that uh, is really a significant design attribute of Cyber Spectre. You know, it's one of the things about her that I think stands out the most. It's a nice point of contrast within the character. Um, we got uh, a lot more value play happening there, a little bit more, again, contrast where you're dealing with these thick black shadows that kind of run along the forms and describe them, the forms of her belly here, and then ultimately her arms where we're also going to place this chrome shading, this chrome uh, aesthetic for the rendering. And then you've got these other kind of organic lines, these very thin uh, fine lines that essentially, I guess, serve as the, the blending between the pure blacks and the, the pure whites, but only to a certain extent because, you know, the thing with chrome is that it's very, very reflective. So you don't want to blend it too much into the shadows and the highlights. You know, you don't want a widespread there. Uh, you do want a uh, you want a fairly dramatic transition from the blacks to the whites. To be honest with you, um, in other words, you don't want to use an, an overabundance of hatches in order to make that blend smooth. You want it to be a bit more. Uh, you want it to be a bit more um, dramatic than that. So yeah. This is something that I try to keep in mind as much as possible and, and in order to get that reflective appeal within the chrome because, yeah, if you blend things too much, what tends to happen is the, the surface material that you're trying to convey starts to look matte. And that's totally fine for a matte material. You know, certain materials are going to have that aesthetic to it. Uh, chrome, again, is just a very reflective material. And I think that it's great to have that level of contrast throughout a character design specifically where you've got some materials that are kind of matte looking, you've got some that are leather looking, you've got some that are super metallic and reflective looking like he, like he was Cyber Spectre. And uh, that's a great thing to have, um, especially when you can mix value and tone into that. 
Like here you'll notice with Cyber Spectre, you know, we've got the hair and that's introducing a certain level of tone and thus contrast within the character. But now that we're moving on to the Chrome and we're working on that, you can see that, hey, we're dealing with much darker values here. We've got these thick black, pure black shadows. And then we've not only not only are they pure black, but they also got this organic, almost like uh, oily, like slick river-like shape to them. You know, it's very liquid, liquefied. Is is probably the best word that I could use here to describe the aesthetic for these shadows. And uh, and because of that organicness, it kind of contrasts really well with the rest of the character. I think. But uh, again, the tone also does that as well because it's, it's significantly darker. You know, if you squint your eyes, those blacks are going to really stand out to you. And again, people love contrast within a character design. Now, um, I'm not sure who exactly is responsible for designing Cyber Spectre because I didn't design her. I'm kind of working off of the design here to compose this illustration, which, you know, makes it kind of fun. Although I do love character design, I have to admit. I, I love character design. It's one of my most favorite things to do, especially when it's for comic books. You've probably seen some of the, the character design concept videos that I've done for uh, Rob Arnold for his comic book, Replicator. Um, and... And you know, but for this particular illustration, I didn't have to worry about designing the character. Whoever did design the character, though, did a really good job because they introduced that contrast to them, and that contrast makes the character more readable and it makes them more interesting to look at. And that's something which I think is important to incorporate into a character in order to give them that additional level of appeal. Otherwise, everything just comes across as flat. You know, there's nothing really there to, to catch your eye. There's nothing that stands out. And so you want this kind of balance, this dance of different contrasts, of different materials, and, and even different colors when you start to introduce color into a character to kind of, yeah, again, give, give it a higher level of visual stimulation uh, because monotony and sameness is just going to look boring to, to the audience. It's not going to capture their attention. It's going to be something which just kind of, you know, it's not going to leave an impact or an impression of any kind. Um, so I'm going around the character and I'm adding in these slick, again, liquefied looking render lines to cyber specter's chrome plated armor and uh, the cool thing about chrome plated armor the thing that i love most is as complicated and as intimidating as it looks it doesn't actually require any kind of over analytical or logical thinking as long as you know where the core shadows are going to go and in this case we we have a pretty good idea as to where they're going to go based on the light direction which as I mentioned before, is coming from the top right and shining and projecting down onto the character. That gives us an indication as to where those those major core shadows are going to be placed. And then as far as the actual placement of those core shadows go, well, you can kind of pick any shape you want for that. It, you know, it's good if you can get the shape to kind of describe the form that it's it's being cast upon, but I mean, when it comes to chrome, really what you're trying to suggest at the end of the day, chrome being a very reflective material, is the surrounding environment being mirrored into the, into the metal. But the thing is, is that when you're talking about metallic skin, which is essentially what we're rendering here for Cyber Spectre, then the organic forms that are being essentially... Uh, that serve as that mirror that the environment is going to be reflected within are going to morph and skew and distort that reflection in very randomized ways. So it's not going to be a perfect reflection. You know, if you had a chrome sheet of metal that was perfectly flat, then maybe you'd get a nice, you know, exact replica of, of the projected environment within it. But you're not going to see that within an organic plated, uh, chrome plated uh, piece of anatomy. Um, you know, like on the belly and the legs and the arms of Cyber Spectre here. In that particular circumstance, because of the randomness of the surface of that the particular material that's that's covering the the body there, um, you're going to get these these very distorted reflections of the environment. So it doesn't really have to look like anything. That's what I'm trying to get at here. You don't have to like, you know, I'm not attempting to try to 
redraw the background buildings within uh, Cyber Spectre's leg or, you know, her her midsection there. I'm just kind of, you know, I'm placing in a bunch of random lines. I'm kind of, you know, making them look squiggly and, and suggesting that they might be something. But because the, the reflections are so distorted on that particular surface, um, it doesn't really matter. Like, no one could kind of sit there and, and tell you what it should look like or, you, you know, uh, pick out an error necessarily. This is more about against suggestion and a lot of comic book art is about suggestion you're not really trying to create a rendition of reality here or an exact rendition at least you're 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 more creating a stylized representation of it and it's that stylized representation that people love comic books for comic book art in general we love that over-the-top stylization if it starts to look too real it does get to a point where it just kind of becomes boring you know it doesn't it doesn't provide that experience that allows us to escape from reality anymore because it is reality. And so, yeah, you know, like don't don't necessarily worry about that stuff too much. Don't fret over how real your chrome plated armor looks for your characters because, you know, as long as it kind of looks reflective and like it might be reflecting something, that's totally fine. That's that's all you really need to do. Most importantly, it needs to look cool. And that's why I love doing Chrome Armor, most importantly, because it just looks really, really cool on a character. So when you can incorporate it into your character's design, um, I think that it can add a lot of drama to the character. It can really pull the audience in with that added level of contrast and interest. And yeah, it's just going to be visually stimulating. It's going to be much more visually stimulating. Now, I know not all characters can have chrome-plated armor, but if you do have one that does, you know, at least one, um, that can uh, that can be enough. You know, in a cast of characters, that can be enough. Uh, now we've moved on to the other character, and the other character, as I said before, is going to have more of a, a brunette tone to her hair. So it's going to be much darker in value, right, than the, the blonde hair of Cyber Spectre. Um, now, as far as this character's name, it kind of escapes me at this point in time. We'll just call her the brunette um, because, you know, that's a, a significant attribute of this particular character's design. Um, and so, you know, what I'm trying to establish here is the overall flow and shape of her hair, the, the style that it's been shaped into through the use of the strands and uh, the, I guess, you know, they're not really strands, they're more directional guidelines that suggest texture, uh, the texture that would be created by the individual strands that make up the overall whole of the character's hairstyle. And the reason that I'm doing that is because in order for me to be able to drop in the shadows and render it effectively, I've got to know exactly how the hair is forming. Um, otherwise, I'm just kind of guessing, right? Now, because her hair is black uh, or, you know, a very dark shade of some color in particular, you know, it's basically black. Um, and can you have black-haired brunettes? Is that is that what a brunette is? I think it's kind of like encompasses multiple colors. I think it encompasses, you know, dark chestnut brown and and black and, and what have you. But um, in order to do that effectively, what I like to place in is what I, what I would call a shadow draft, essentially, which is just me roughing in the dark areas of the hair, the shadows and where they're going to be placed, and then I'll kind of put that onto a separate layer that I can convert to blue, and then I'll just kind of, you know, run my pen over the top. However, in this instance, it looks like I didn't stick with that idea. You know, maybe it didn't work out very well, or I thought it wouldn't work out for one reason or another. So I'm kind of just going in there, and I'm roughing those shadows in. Uh, I'm trying not to overthink it too much, because uh, in this instance, when you start to overthink organic aspects within the illustration, such as hair, even clothing folds this can apply to, um, especially the chrome that I was talking about before. You know, very organic, free-flowing attributes within the, the character designs. Um, it, it, when you start to overthink that stuff, you get this very kind of uh, sterile result. It starts to look stiff and lifeless, and it doesn't really... Um, you know, it doesn't really work out in your best interest in the long run. And so uh, usually what I like to do in that is, is I like to try to loosen up 
in that particular circumstance. I like to try to let go a little bit, get out of my head, and just start having fun with it, as much fun as I possibly can. And so what I did is I grabbed my pen here, and then I just started dropping in the shadows, and then I kind of cleaned them up a little bit, and then I'm attempting to render them out somewhat. Um, but I'm not going to lie, I did have a little bit of trouble with this. Um, I usually have trouble with darker shaded hair, and I know that that other artists would probably have the, the opposite response to that because when it comes to black hair, you can kind of hide a lot of stuff underneath the blacks. Like you don't have to add in as much detail. But for me, it was just something that, you know, I guess maybe I didn't do enough of. And because I didn't do enough of it, I became more uncomfortable with it. And, you know, the longer you leave this stuff unaddressed, the it, it's not like you, you progress any further from that. You, it kind of re remains a problem until you get over it, you know, <laughs> and, and you start practicing it enough that it's not a problem anymore. And uh, that was very, that's very much been dark colored hair for me, funnily enough, for a long time. Um, you know, and uh, I always kind of changed up my approach to, to drawing hair a lot of the time. And I figured out how I went about light colored hair. As you can see, there was Cyber Spectre. I didn't have too many problems with it, but then. I guess I didn't know how to translate my approach for light colored hair over to dark colored hair. And as a result, it, I kind of had to figure out, figure that out, especially in this commission. Um, I wasn't quite sure exactly what I was going to do, but, you know, I eventually figured it out in the end and I, I don't think that it came out half bad. I think it, it looked, it looked all right. And uh, I was happy with the end result. So, you know, the thing I love about black hair is that it, adds that potent level of contrast to a character and it, it frames their face, especially on a woman where you've got a face which has a, a fairly minimal amount of detail. You know, you don't want to over render a female character's face because that's going to, you know, ruin their feminine appeal. It's going to blemish, give their skin a blemished appearance. Um, and that's just what rendering tends to do. It either makes your character, especially their face, it either makes it look gaunt or it just makes their skin look blemished. And for a young, youthful appearance on a woman, you want to try to avoid both those things. So when you've got this light-colored face with a minimal amount of detail being framed by dark-colored hair, it, it just, you know, it really draws in the audience's attention right to the face because it's like that, that white dot on a black canvas. Um, you know, you've got the white directly contrasting with the black. And uh, that's just really, really cool because you want the face of a character to be the first point of attention. Um, that's where the audience is going to get their best read on the character as far as the, their ability to emotionally connect with them and relate with them. And the more that the audience is able to do that, the, the more of a connection they're going to be able to make and the more memorable the character is going to be, the more that they're going to like the character, essentially. So the hair is done on this character, thank goodness, because that was probably the most difficult part of the illustration overall. And now I get to do some more chrome-plated uh, rendering on her gun here. It's a cool little gun, I got to admit. It's, it's very stylish. And uh, then we're going to, let's see here, there is going to come a point where I end up adding some, some chrome-plated rendering to her leg there. Now it looks like for some reason or another, I'm going back and I'm redoing the, the shadows on this, this lovely lady's hair. And I have no idea why, because I thought that that looked all right. And oftentimes that tends to happen for me is something will look okay and then I'll go back and I'll redo it for some reason um, because I'm a crazy perfectionist and uh, sometimes I just can't leave something if I'm not entirely happy with it. You know, I'm not that kind of, I'm not that good enough guy. It's got to be perfect. Um, of course, I did this a little while ago and so, you know, as I've developed, as I've practiced my art and, and kind of refining my craft, I've I've come to the realization that, hey, sometimes good enough is fine. And that if you can kind of get into that mindset, it allows you to relax and do way better work in the long run just as a result. Now, for me, I think that the reason that I went back and I redid the shadows for this character's hair is because 
the lighting wasn't quite balanced and, and the shininess wasn't quite there that needed to be there in order to get it to pop. And I've noticed here, just as I'm watching it back, that you know I've got that nice highlight on the side of the head there and running along the, the middle of the fringe. And I think that the positioning of those highlights are just you know a little bit better. Now, uh, I know that this seems like a total waste of time and most people wouldn't probably be bothered going back and, and redoing it uh, from scratch. Um, and I gotta admit that even watching me do this right now, damn, I must have had a lot of motivation and, and really been not happy with it to go back and, and redo it like this. But, you know, I think that it's good when you've got that level of commitment to be able to go back and, and rehash the things that you're not entirely happy with in order to come out of it with a much better result because you only get to do an illustration once, right? I mean, um, unless, you know, you're, you're jumping on the bandwagon with, uh, with some of these... Um, you know, challenges that they have on Instagram every now and then and and going back and redoing old illustrations just to see how far you've come in the game. But, uh, you know, most of the time you're going to leave it as is. Once it's done, it's done and you're not going to revisit it and nor do you really want to once you call it done. And so if you only really get to work on it once, then then why not put in the effort to, to make it the best that it possibly can be each and every time? Because as long as it's the best that you could have done, that's really the only level of perfectionism that you've got to strive for within your work. And uh, I think that that's a healthy way to look at perfectionism. You know, you're capable of a certain level of uh, perfectionism, so to speak. You're capable of a certain level of quality within your work and, and achieving that quality. And so I think that as long as you're able to know where that bar sits and you, you're confident that you can reach it within your artwork, like you know, like you've sat there and you have reached it before, then, then you can strive for that same level of quality and, and perfectionism again in the next illustration. And that's really all that you should be measuring yourself against. So I've kind of gone back and, you know, I've, I've redone this this hair a bunch of times now, and I guess I'm going to, to have to re-render it out as well. Um, so this lovely lady's hairdo really consumed a lot of my time, um, probably more time than it was worth. And, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there does come a point sometimes where I just go, you know, stuff it, I'm going to work on something else because this has just given me too much of a headache. And uh, I'll go back and I'll, I'll kind of re-attend to it later. And uh, in the meantime, what I'll do is I'll focus on something more fun, like the chrome-plated leg armor that she's got here. I think it's supposed to be a mechanical leg of some kind. But uh, nonetheless, super, super fun. Again, I'm using the main primary light source within the illustration to figure out where the shadows need to sit within the forms that her mechanical leg consists of. And then I'm kind of rendering it out from there. And I am, you know, as I place these shadows, again, I am trying to describe the form that I'm working with somewhat and suggest its shape, suggest its surface, and then kind of rendering it out around that. But, you know, again, these shadows, keep them organic, keep them smooth and, and flowy. Make sure that you're not uh, that you're not getting too structured with them because if it looks too structured, it's going to lose the the natural aspects that make Chrome look cool. And Chrome needs to look organic. It needs to to have that that liquefied effect to make it work. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going through and and I'm kind of adding those shadows in there, and I like the way it's looking. Chrome for me is a uh, is one of those wonderful parts of a comic book illustration that I get a lot of joy out of working on. And uh, I think that th the reason for that is because I can kind of, I'm able to let go a little bit and I'm able to think about it less and I guess get creative with it. You know, a lot of what makes a well-structured illustration work is kind of analyzing it and making sure that, you know, the proportions are in check, the composition looks good, and the anatomy works out. But with things like chrome and, you know, even hair to an extent, um, you can kind of get more creative with it, and uh, you, you get into that different zone within your creativity, within your artwork, that allows you to, you know, put the, the analysis and the thinking on the sidelines and replace that with just, you know... Uh, this this almost automated 
creativity where you can get lost in the artwork. And、uh, I love that. That's one of the best feelings that I strive for when it comes to creating these illustrations. And I think that the more you practice and the more experienced you get, and the more you get a handle on the aspects of your approach that maybe you're not so confident is, in. The more confident you get, and the more confident that you get, the less that you do have to think about it in the long run, and then you can sink into that creative zone where, you know, you're able to turn on some music and just really get into the mood of of creativity and just really get into the zone. You know, it sounds kind of airy fairy when I put it like that, and a little bit magical, probably more magical than it actually is. But、uh, I'm telling you, that's that's when I'm really I'm really enjoying. The comic art craft when I'm really when I'm really there in、uh, in my element and I enjoy that you know that's that's what I live for when it comes to comic book illustration. So now、uh, I'm having another crack at this lovely lady's hair, and、uh, I'm trying to figure it all out, and I'm not sure exactly what's going to work and what's not going to work. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things where hair in comic books. Can be approached in so many different ways, and every artist is going to have their own approach. You know that the the way of working with hair that fits best with them, that allows them to convey what they're trying to convey, in、uh, in the way that they they want to present it to their audience. And for me, I guess I always look to other artists to try and figure that out for myself. You know, I looked at the way that they did hair and and the way that they went about it. And I tried to find a influence that would allow me to do the same thing. That would allow me to present the hair of my characters in the way that they presented it, and and that's why I would try to find you know an artist that I really liked. And I find that it's always that balance where you're trying to find a style for yourself that's influenced by someone else or by multiple other artists. But you're also trying to get that style to fit in with the natural look that you want to go for, because it's not your style isn't going to be built purely off of other artists. You're going to add your own spin to it and your own twist, and、uh, you know that's a good thing. You, you want that. You want your own artistic identity to an extent, your own look,、um, even if it is bl-、uh, composed of a blended together. Uh, mix of multiple other artists. You know, eventually you're going to shine through, regardless of of whether you you try to or not. It's just that you know your own tastes and and the the genres you like to work in and the the, the way that you move your hand and the amount of pressure that you, you apply to your stylist, the way that you throw a line, that physically is going to affect the look of your work. So it's never going to be a perfect replica, even if you are working and and being influenced by a single artist. Now it just so happens that the way that I've approached the hair now in this particular circumstance is is、uh, is working out for me. I, I think that this is a bit more natural and and fits in with the way that I, I've approached Cyber Spectre's hair a little bit more.、Um, it's it's very much the same approach. It's just that you know I'm really starting to thicken up the the major. Outlines within the hair, the major shapes. You know, I'm adding thicker shadows around them, especially within the pockets of the hair that are facing away from the light, that are hidden from the light, that are getting a minimum amount of light. And I'm also adding more rendering around those areas as well to to push it back, to give more depth within the darker areas of the hair, and then to lift it out with the highlights in contrast. And combined, you know, that lowers the overall value of the hair. That I'm working with, but it also gives it that again that added amount of 3Dness that makes the hair pop up of the page. And I think every aspect of your artwork, you try to want to implement that without over detailing it too much, without adding in unneeded amounts of of rendering and and cross hatching and and texturing and and what have you. Because if you don't have the right balance there, then that's going to throw off everything else. It's it's going to ruin it. So I think that it's it's great to be able to render. That's awesome. You know, being able to render doesn't actually take that much practice. You can kind of pick it up fairly fast. But knowing how to place it and where to place it are, are two different things. And the the really tough part is that I've found that I still struggle with is figuring out. Where to place the rendering? Where is it going to have the most impact? Where is it actually needed? And I think 
that's the trick is is placing it in only the places that it needs to be because if you start adding in unneeded amounts of rendering to you know areas of the illustration that it's just not going to affect in a complementary way then um, you know it's going to take more away from the illustration than it gives and make no mistake rendering can quickly lead you down a dark and terrible path that ultimately winds up winds you up with an illustration that isn't readable that doesn't make any visual sense and is just disorientating to look at um Ultimately, at the end of the day, you want to be giving your illustrations as much depth as possible, but also as much readability as possible. And if you can get those two things right, then you'll be pretty good to go. You'll have a captivating illustration there that you know looks convincing, that looks solid, that, that people enjoy the experience of looking at. If it's over-detailed and there's no balance of, of contrast there and value in it, it's going to lose its readability and it's going to be uncomfortable to look at, quite frankly. It's just, it's not going to be nice to experience because, um, you know, again, the, the eyes and the, the way that we take things in through our pupils, it, it happens in a particular way. You know, we, we break things down in a particular way and visually digest them. Uh, based on you know our depth perception and the values within the environment within the scene that we're observing that allow us to do so that that give the scene depth at least the the ways in which our eyes perceive depth and so we're just trying to replicate that and imitate it within our artwork that's all that we're trying to do here with the rendering um, besides the fact that we're also trying to suggest texture and different materials you know point in case with the chrome plated metals that are present within this illustration so i am actually much happier with the way that uh this lovely lady's hair actually turned out in the long run um i think it looks much better and again it's kind of much more consistent with my overall style you know that kind of detailed look and i do try to keep my approach simple but i i like to have the outcome look somewhat you know, visually uh, enticing through the amount of detail that I'm I'm suggesting within it. Uh, in other words, I try to make it look like there's more detail within my artwork than is actually there. And uh, I think that the best artists attempt to do that. Um, not that I'm saying I'm one of the best, uh, but I do think that, you know, one of the, the masterful things that artists like Jim Lee and Mark Silvestri try to do, maybe not Todd McFarlane so much. I mean, there is a lot of detail within Todd McFarlane's work. Um, and sometimes, you know, there has been illustrations that I've seen by him that, you know, are probably just a little bit over detailed to the point where, you know, that unbalance is that, that imbalance rather is present. So now I'm pretty much done with the characters, I think, at this point. Besides a few, you know, little additional details that I'm going to add in at the end, um, I'm, I'm really focused on these, these background buildings and, uh, you know, essentially the platform that these characters are sitting upon, that they're being presented upon. And, you know, because these elements are within the foreground, we're going to see a significantly greater amount of detail than the inorganic man-made buildings in the background. Um, so what I'm trying to consider here is because I've gone for a fairly clean looking architecture, how do I keep it looking clean and and mechanical in the, in the way that I have, but also add this a certain amount of texture, a certain amount of material that kind of adds a bit more intrigue to the overall rendered finish that these these foreground buildings and I guess objects you know they're not exactly buildings they're kind of like the the air vents and and the structures that you'd see on top of a, a large building for example um, you know how do I add enough in visual interest to them uh, to make it look like they're in the foreground to actually pull them forward a little bit more because Anything in the foreground, the, the, the best way to make it appear as though it's closer than the things in the background is just to give it a thicker outline in order to emphasize its shape and then to give it more detail. In other words, give it more rendering, give it more texture, give it more, uh, 
you know, a little bit more grunge. Not too much grunge, though, because, again, you know, these are these are supposed to be clean-looking buildings. I don't want to detail them and render them to the point where they look like, you know, they, they're they suffering from, you know, a, a massive amount of rust or something like that, like decay. Like, they look like a, a ship that's been at the bottom of the ocean for decades, right? I want to... I want to make it look detailed enough that, and incorporate the amount of detail that needs to be there to kind of suggest that, hey, you're looking at clean looking buildings, but there's also a certain amount of texture there, but not so much to the point where it's it's over detailed to the max and it doesn't make any sense for that, the particular architecture that I've gone for. Okay, everything needs to make sense. Uh, whatever amount of rendering you're adding into your illustrations, it, it needs to feed into the overall idea that you, you're ultimately trying to present. So now we're back onto some more Chrome rendering, my favorite thing in the world, where I'm starting to, uh, I'm kind of adding in the rendering for Cyberspectre's gun. This is a really fun gun to, to work on as well. You can see that its overall shape actually kind of fits in with the the fluid kind of organic shapes that we're seeing within the chrome rendering uh the chrome shading so i mean that's cool because it's it's got this nice kind of rounded or organic flow to it that i think fits well with the design and uh and not only that but when you add that rendering in there damn does it look cool and i think that's the coolest thing about chrome is that it just in the end it just it looks awesome, and it's it's a really awesome component to be able to add into your illustrations that are going to up the visual appeal of pretty much anything that has the, the Chrome material applied to it, whether it be a character, whether it be weaponry, or what have you. You know, a lot of 90s comic books had characters with big guns in it, you know, both in terms of muscle and weaponry, that had uh, Chrome-plated materials applied to it, and it... It was one of the, those staple aesthetics within the 90s image era that I think really caught people's attention and uh, and had them salivating at the eyeballs for more. <laughs> so I, I think, you know, maybe I took that with me, um, but I think it still looks cool. And I think that you'll agree with me in saying that because it's just, again, I think the reason that it looks so cool is, is you are dealing with those organic shapes within the rendering, but you've, you've also got the added amount of contrast within it as well that uh, that really up the visuals to to that next level of uh, intrigue and, and visual um, visual stimulation is what I would say. Visual stimulation is is really something that, that comes about with that added contrast. And you want your audience to be visually stimulated uh, because if they're, <laughs> they're visually unstimulated by the illustration that you've created, well, that's not a good thing, certainly not. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I'm adding in a drop shadow here underneath Cyber Spectre's chin just to lift the head up off the neck a little bit. Drop shadows are fantastic because they're, they're another tool that we can use to suggest form, but not necessarily in the way that we'd suggest it with regular rendering. You know, regular rendering we use to, you know, describe the form that the shadow on the shadow that around the, the actual form, right? But the thing with the car shadow is that it's it's another shadow that's being cast onto a form from another form. So that kind of suggests the solidity of the different forms within your illustration. Um, and that, you know, the that one form is actually blocking the light from hitting another as it casts a shadow upon it which is really, really cool. Again, you want to try to add as many things as you can like that. Now, it looks like I I, I took away the shading that I added before on this uh, this foreground element. Um, I don't know when I did that or why I did that, but obviously I wasn't happy with it for one reason or another. And it looks like I'm also going back to the drawing board here to try to design and and, and add a more complex aesthetic to the, the elements that I've come up with here. And uh, I guess that I just thought they were a bit too simplified and that they weren't really going to allow me to add the level of detail and interest that I wanted to have here in the foreground. So I'm kind of going back over and I'm, I'm redesigning it, trying to make something that looks a bit more cool, adding these steel panels that uh, really lend to the sci-fi aesthetic that I've I've been, or the theme really, that I've been going for with this entire illustration. And... Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, 
this is probably going to be another time consuming area that I'm going to be working on here for for the next few minutes and and again it's because there's going to be more detail the more detail that you have within your illustration in area or any area within it is going to require more time because you're going to be laying in more lines and that's just the nature of it so it's kind of like a uh, it's an investment it's an investment of time in order to get a greater amount of detail and visual interest out of your illustration so uh yeah, hopefully, you know, you can you might be able to hear the rain in the background right now um, hitting against my window. It's a rainy day here in Melbourne, Australia, and uh, we, we get lots of wild weather here. Sometimes we have cold days, sometimes we have hot days. It doesn't really matter whether or not we're in summer or winter. Uh, that's just the way the cookie crumbles here. <laughs> so, you know, uh, you never know what's a wet. You know, I'm, I'm supposed to be going out later and uh, I'm catching a gig. I'm going to one of my, one of the few rock gigs that, that I go to. Uh, it's more metal, I guess. I don't really know the band, but a friend suggested that I should check it out. So I'm going to head on down into to Melbourne City in a bit and uh, probably after I upload this video, actually. And I'm going to check it out, see what's happening. But, um, you know, I'm going to have to have to fig figure out and decide what I'm going to wear uh, because it looks like a pretty darn cold day. But you never know. The, the, the weather might turn around and the, the sun might come out and it might actually end up being quite a lovely, pleasant day. Again, you just never know. <laughs> so, yeah, if uh, hopefully the, the rain's not, you know, overpowering my voice too much as I narrate this, really the last chapter in the Cyber Spectre series that... I've I've been putting out here on the on the channel and you know it's it's really spanned over three videos because of just the amount of time and the amount of work that goes into an illustration of this magnitude and you, you know I know that it doesn't uh, necessarily maybe on the surface it doesn't seem like a lot like you, you know you see the characters they don't have a whole lot of detail incorporated into them and even the background buildings um, you know, on their own, they're pretty simple to, to execute. You know, if you're only drawing one of them, it'll be totally fine. You get that done in like five minutes. But when you're talking about the number of components that have gone into this illustration in particular, you know, the amount of, you know, maybe small, simple things that have been incorporated into it, uh, the time does add up. And so I guess one of the unspoken skills that you need to develop as a comic book artist is your ability to sit down and just work on something for hours on end without getting bored and uh you know the good thing about comic book illustration is it is kind of challenging enough to stave off boredom at least to a point but you know when you get onto the inking stage where you know, you're kind of going over the top of stuff that you've already done and the, the, there's not a whole lot of guesswork yet uh, left to be had. You know, it can be monotonous. It, it can get to the point where, uh, oh man, when is this going to be done? You know, it's just like, especially when you're working on a foreground element like this, you know, it's not really that it's not really that interesting, you know, it's just, it's buildings, right, so you have to kind of talk yourself up a little bit, you got to go, you got to make yourself as interested in the buildings as you were in the characters to an extent, because the buildings are going to require just as much dedication and just as much time to get done, and, you know, they'll kind of complement the characters in the end, so it's worth doing, and that's the kind of thing I tell myself when I'm working on them, I'm like, hey, you know, like, Man, it's going to take you a while to do these buildings, and I know they're not the most riveting thing to work on, but hey, it's going to make the characters look that much better. You know, this is the, the stage that you're setting for them, literally, so you want to put that time in it, and it's worth it. And I think that it does get to a point for me where, again, I really start trying to strategize exactly how can, how can I incorporate a solid amount of detail into this without uh, actually adding that that detail you know how can i imply the detail without taking the time to actually put it in right so i'm cheating i like to look for ways to cheat <laughs> in a in a sense to an extent i don't like actual cheating i think actual cheating is, is only going to take away from your art but uh 
yeah, again, I mean, oftentimes we make things more complicated than we than they need to be when it comes to comic book illustration. So I'm as I'm watching this, I'm watching myself kind of approach rendering in particular ways that are just going to be way too time consuming for what the rendering is going to be able to deliver to the final illustration so you know I'm getting rid of that approach and I'm changing things up a little bit I'm I'm trying out a new way of rendering you know maybe I can get the same implied amount of of shading without with a with a less amount of rendering less hatches and the less hatches that I'm able, that I'm putting in, while also being able to still suggest that form and that texture and the materials within the particular element that I'm working on, the better because it means that I can get this illustration done faster and still have it executed at the same level of quality that I like to see within my artwork. You know, I'm not sacrificing too much by doing that. Because the longer you, that you spend on an illustration, the more bored that you're going you're going to get of it. Uh, you're going to find that it kind of it, it gets to a it almost gets to this apex where it stops being fun and it starts taking away from your soul a little bit. You know, you're you're starting to get discouraged. You're not looking forward to working on the illustration anymore. It's dragged on for long enough. So, you know, you you don't want to dwell on an illustration. Is what I'm trying to say to you here. You want to try to get it done as fast as you possibly can so that, um, you know, you can enjoy the experience of working on it the entire way through without it being, you know, a hindrance and an unpleasurable experience and still wind out with something that you can be proud of. So if you can wind out with something that you can be proud of and actually have enjoyed working on it at the same time without, you know, the memory of the ordeal that, that you went through to get it done... Uh, well, that's the the best possible experience that you can hope for as an artist, and I, I guess that a lot of comic book creators kind of run into this when they are on a run of the same story for a long period of time. You know, say that you're you're working on Spider Man for a long period of time, or I remember when uh, when Greg Capullo kind of left Spawn. You know, he had been working on Spawn for so many issues. That it just got to the point where he was done with Spawn. He didn't want to look at Spawn anymore. He had drawn Spawn that so many times that he was just downright sick of it. Now I'm kind of uh, you know paraphrasing there. Maybe maybe he didn't feel that that badly about it. But I got to imagine. I've got to imagine that even if I was creating, even if I created my own story and I was working with my own characters, you know, for like let's say you know even even ten issues, I feel like I'd be over it by that point. Which is probably why, you know, as I start thinking about creating my own comic book, uh, which I really am doing, you know, I've got a script going on, believe it or not, and it's sounding all right, you know, I, I'm thinking the more that I add to this script, the, the more excited I get to do this comic book and to jump into it, so... You know, you might just see a few more demonstrations of me coming up with some concepts for the characters that, are, that I'm going to feature within it. But in saying that, you know, as as buzzed as I get about the story and as much as I might fall in love with these characters, there's only a certain amount of times that I'm, I'm going to want to draw them before, um, you know, it just starts becoming something that, you know, I don't want to do anymore, before it becomes boring. You know, the, the more that you're exposed to something, the more bored that you get of it. It, it, it loses that novelty, which is why it does take a certain amount of dedication to complete a comic book, um, especially a comic book series, because you're going to lose interest in it at some point. There's going to be more enticing ideas that uh, tempt you, that, that take you away from, from the idea that you're working on. But the only thing that gets anything done is, is dedication and your ability to stave off that temptation for as long as you possibly can. So, you know, you want to try to exercise your dedication muscle, your focus muscle to the point where you, you're able to stick with something for, for an extended amount of time before you, you jump off of it and move on to something else. You want to stick with it at least for as long as it takes to get it done. And uh, that especially applies to, you know, comic books, but also to single illustrations like the one that you're seeing me do up here on the page. So, uh, yeah, what I'm doing in in this particular foreground, I guess, uh, stage that I've set up for the characters here. I'm just going to take a sip of water. I mean, I can't believe that I've 
been talking straight for 54 minutes here and, and not had a sip of water. I, I really don't treat my, my throat very well. <laughs> Ah, that feels much better. All right, I've got my voice back. Okay, so as I was saying, what I'm trying to do is uh, you'll notice that I've got light elements or lighter value elements sitting in front of darker shaded elements. Okay, so the foreground uh, mechanical structure that Cyberspectre is sitting on is lighter in tone than those that are in the background, okay? And that creates a certain level of overlap. It creates depth because there's that contrast there. And that's how you get one element to stand out from another element, by sitting a lighter element or a darker element against a darker element or a lighter element. Um, as long as that contrast between the lighter and darker elements is at play, you're going to see some level of distinction between the two. And uh, that's where the, the mastery of, of rendering really starts to shine through within an artist is when they know how to play around with it in that way and, and how to compose it. Because rendering takes a certain level of ability to compose it well, uh, as well as the overall composition of the illustration itself. Um, in fact, every single component that you add into an illustration to bring it through to completion is going to require a certain level of composition. It's not just the way that the characters are standing and and positioned in comparison to one another, or you know the way that the background frames them necessarily. It's it's the values that you've used to to get the characters to stand out against from one another. It's uh, it's everything essentially that that makes the illustration um, look like an illustration that that brings it together. So yeah. Now I'm just adding in the finishing touches at this point. I'm bringing some some hair in at the back of this character um, because I figured that hair that's this long would kind of you you would see it behind her her torso there. So you know you, you want to try to make everything look cons as consistent as possible um, because uh, if when when people start to notice those inconsistencies, that's when the illustration starts to fall apart and uh, that's not a good thing because you know you want to try to suspend their, their disbelief for as long as possible before they wise up and realize that they are just looking at a comic book illustration and hopefully they never get to that point hopefully you've you've sucked them in enough that uh, you, you're able to hold their attention there until they you know they close the entire book or they walk away from the illustration um, you want it to be memorable as, as something that was captivating to them and not something that didn't make any sense or was boring or was inconsistent. So I'm adding in a bit of a cast drop shadow along the bottom of this lovely lady's skirt here. It's a, it's a little bit of a short skirt. You know, I'm trying to try to add that sex appeal, incorporate a little bit of sex appeal into this illustration. Um, you know, sex appeal is, is never a bad thing when it comes to comic books, at least in my opinion. I mean, uh, most people like to see a little bit of sex appeal it's it's certainly not something that's unattractive about an illustration you can do it badly and you can go overboard with it but uh as long as there's a healthy balance just like there's a healthy balance of everything else in a comic book illustration um you'll be set you know i always like to compare this to uh to, to the amount of salt and pepper that you put onto a good meal you know it can complement the meal but if you put if if you pop off the top of the shaker and you just pour it on, it's not going to taste very nice. You know, it's going to be a little bit too much. So you don't want to go overboard on any one complementary aspect within your comic book illustrations uh, and essentially overkill everything else, um, because that's that's not going to work out for you in the long run. Um, it's it's not going to work out for anyone. Uh, but you'll notice that, yeah, it's it's always a balance. Like with Cyber Spectre, you can see the minimal amount of rendering are placed onto the different parts of her costume and then the, the significantly increased amounts of rendering that are placed into the, the chrome areas of the character. You know, that that dance of tone and value is, is one of the things that are going to add the most amount of visual appeal to your illustration. And uh, so you want to get good at it, as good as you possibly can. And uh, that just about wraps up this entire demonstration, you know, the three-part series of Cyberspectre. 
I really hope that you've enjoyed watching it and that you've learned a lot. Hopefully you have. I think all up, if you combine these video demonstrations, we've gone through, you know, at least two and a half hours of, of content there. So hopefully you've learned a thing or two uh, along the way. I've really enjoyed putting them together for you. We'll we'll come up with a new uh, comic book illustration series real soon. Uh, you know, I've got a few video demos sitting back there in the old archive that I think uh, it'll be fun to pull out and kind of show you what, what they're all about. But for now... I've uh, I've taken up enough of your time, so so thanks so much for watching. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, if you'd like more comic art tips, tricks, and tutorials, be sure to visit www.howtodrawcomics.net, and uh, you know you'll find over on the website a ton of written tutorials. You know, going over all aspects of comic book art, like um, you know eyes, for example. That's one of our latest tutorials. Um, we got a huge comic art making guide on there as well. It's over 11,000 words, which is just insane. You know, Joe Catapano put that together for us, and, and I'm really thankful that he did. It's absolutely amazing. He's put a lot of time and effort into that. So check that out if you want to know how to make a comic book in general. And then we've got, of course, all the videos that you can also get here on the YouTube channel. If you'd like to be updated on the new videos that I'm putting out, you know, at the moment of really up my game as far as the YouTube videos go. I've been putting out, you know, three or four a week lately. Hopefully we can keep that up. Um, but yeah, if you want to be notified on new videos, make sure that you subscribe and that you hit the bell because you have to hit the bell in order to be notified. It, subscribing just isn't enough anymore. you got to hit the bell as well. Um, so do that. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, the other way to be to ensure that you're updated with uh, with new content from howtodrawcomics.net is just to head on over to the site, subscribe to the email list. You know, I don't tend to bombard the email list too much, um, but, you know, when there's an, an important tutorial video or course that comes out, I try to let everyone know about it. And, uh, of course, with in regards to the courses, um, you'll find uh, a bunch of those over on the, the howtodrawcomics.net website. I've got my superheroines course up there, um, which delves into a lot of the, the components, actually, that we went over here in the Cyber Spectre demonstration series. Um, we've also I've also got a uh, proportions course as well. So, you know, that's something that I still struggle with, and I do refer back to that course. Uh, a lot of the time because, you know, I put a lot of time into researching that stuff and uh, it's solid. It is solid. It's had a lot of good feedback, a lot of good reviews. And um, yeah, I'm proud of, of what I put together for that one. But also, uh, we got a ton of courses by Robert Marzullo over on the website and Ed Foychuk. So, you know, if you want to, if you're ready to delve into the art of comic book illustration on a deeper level, then I highly recommend uh, heading on over to the site checking out our course selection and uh, getting into them because, you know, we really do have an abundance of education available to us as comic book artists these days. And that's something that I'm very, very thankful for and proud to be a part of. Um, it's one of the reasons that I enjoy being sharing these videos and, uh, and, and this knowledge with you so much here, here on the channel and on the website. So, again, thanks for joining me once again. And I'll see you back here in the next video. Thanks so much for watching. And until next time, keep on creating and keep on practicing. <laughs>